before we begin, we're going to have a word of prayer. And we're going to ask that the Holy Spirit will be with us to guide us in our study. Let us pray at this time. Father in heaven, we come to the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity we have to dive into your word, to look at this very important subject revolving around a plan of redemption. The central theme of the Bible is the redemption plan from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And so, Father, Lord, we thank you that you reveal your plan to save the human race from sin. That, Father, from the foundation of the world, you had this plan already laid out so that sin did not come or take you by surprise. Bless us as we dive into your word. May your Holy Spirit teach us as we learn how we can go from condemnation to justification. In Jesus name. Amen. We're going to dive right into the word of God. Now we're going to Genesis chapter one and we're going to look at how God originally made man. How did God originally make man? Genesis chapter one, looking at verse 26 through 27. That's Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 27. Now, of course, I'm going to be going through quite a few scriptures here. So if you want, if you're not able to keep up, it's good to have a, a pen and a piece of paper so you can write notes. I'll be reading some quotations as well. Genesis chapter one, verses 26 and 27. We're looking at how God originally made man. The Bible says in Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So the Bible makes it clear that we were made in the image of God. That word image in the Hebrew, the definition means resemblance or figure. So we were made to bear the divine resemblance of God, not only physically, but also morally in character. We were made to reflect the image of God, just like a son looks bears the image of his father physically, we bore the image of God physically as well. But of course we know how Satan is marring the image of God, making a man think that he's a woman or a woman think that they can be a man. This is all an invention of the enemy to deface the image of God. But not only were we made in the image of God physically, but we were made in the image of God morally. That's what the Bible reveals to us brothers and sisters. We're going to another scripture here. We're going to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Notice what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. The Bible says, Lo, this only have I found, that God have made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. So from the very beginning, God made man to be upright morally just like God is upright. Let's see that from scripture to show that God is indeed upright. We, sh we know that, but we need to see the Bible. Psalm 25, verse eight. Psalm 25, verse eight. Going to the book of Psalm 25. Psalm, the 25th division of Psalm, looking at verse eight. The Bible says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, will he teach sinners in a way? So the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 25 that God made man upright. And the Bible reveals in Psalm 25 verse 8 that God is upright. So man, we see from scripture, man from the very beginning was made to reflect the image of God, to reflect his character. That word upright means righteous. So when we talk about being upright, we're talking about righteousness. So man reflected the righteousness of God. Let's go to some more scriptures here. Let's look at the attire that Adam and Eve wore from the very beginning. 
that revealed their spiritual condition. Psalm 25, sorry, excuse me, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. What type of physical attire did Adam and Eve wear that revealed their spiritual condition? Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. We have it. I'm going to read it here. It says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Let me show you something real quick from scripture. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sin, we'll talk about what sin is. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse number 7. This is after man has sinned, Adam and Eve. After they sin, this is what happens. Genesis 3 verse 7, it says, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it says the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. But then you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, it says their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. And now they're trying to cover themselves with fig leaves. Hmm. Is the Bible confusing us here? No, it's not confusing us. Adam and Eve did not wear artificial garments. But that doesn't mean they didn't have anything to cover their bodies at all. Psalm 104. Remember, Adam and Eve bore the image of God, not only morally, but also physically. Psalm 104. Psalm 104. The book of Psalm. 104. Verses one and two. Psalm 104. Verse one and two. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So the Bible says that God clothes himself with light as with a garment. And so Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, not only morally, but also physically. So if they bore the physical image of God, brothers and sisters, just like God is clothed in light, they too were clothed in light. This is why the Bible says the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. Their shame was not exposed. Go to Revelation chapter 16. Let me, let me just prove this. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. And we're going to look at Verse number 15, Revelation 16, verse 15, Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. The Bible says we need to keep our garments, lest we walk naked and our shame is exposed. That's basically what it's saying. So the reason why Adam and Eve were not ashamed, even though they were both naked, is because their nakedness or their shame was not exposed. That's why they were not ashamed. They were covered. But after they sinned, they didn't, and because of their sin, after they sinned, they lost their covering. And because of their sin, they were exposed. That's why they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. That's why God says in his word, we need to keep our garments. Watch. Lest we walk naked and they see our shame. Patriots and prophets. This is a powerful book. Patriots and Prophets, page 45, paragraph 3. I want you to notice this. Patriots and Prophets, page 45, paragraph 3. As a man came forth from the hand of his creator, he was of lofty stature and perfect symmetry. His countenance bore the ruddy tint of health and glowed with the light of life and joy. Adam's height was much greater than that of men who now inhabited the earth. Eve was somewhat less in stature, yet her form was noble and full of beauty. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory, such as the angels wear. 
So long as they live in obedience to God, this robe of light continued to enshroud them. So, lo so as long as they were obedient to the requirements of God, this light would continue to enshroud them. But the moment this, this statement reveals and it lines up with scripture, the moment they were they chose to be disobedient, that light would depart from them. Now, what did God do? What command did he give to Adam and Eve to test their loyalty to him? Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter two. Looking at verse number 16 and 17, Genesis chapter two, looking at verse 16 and 17, the Bible says. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So this is a clear command from God. He said, of every tree you see, you may freely eat. That's in the garden. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God has said, you shall not eat of it. For in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. That's a clear command from God. Did Adam and Eve heed the instruction? The Bible gives us the sad history in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Wait a minute, let's stop right here. Is this what God said? I want you to think, brothers and sisters. Is this what God said? Was Eve quoting Cor the word of God correctly. If you answered yes, I'm going to disagree with you. Because God said you shall not eat of it for in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. What did Eve say? Eve said in Genesis chapter three, he said she said right here to the serpent. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you should not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest she die. I wish I had a statement to back up what I'm saying here. But it's clearly right here. I don't need a statement. It's right here in the scripture. She misquoted the word of God. She misquoted the word of God. God didn't say, lest you, uh, neither shall you touch it, lest she die. First of all, they shouldn't have been near, near it anyway, which is true. And it shouldn't uh, to, to even occur to them to touch it. But it's the fact that God made it clear in the day that you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. What I'm bringing out here, brothers and sisters, we got to know the word of God for ourselves. This is what this story is teaching us. We need to know the word of God for ourselves and we need to make sure that what does the Bible say? Study to show yourself approved unto God as a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. You got individuals, brothers and sisters, in these last days, they, they are wrongly dividing the word of truth. And if you don't know the word of God for yourself, if you're not even a show from the word of God, a clear thus said the Lord, and you're fumbling and misquoting, you're not going to be able to stand. This is very serious. Eve misquoted the word of God. First of all, she should have had no discussion with the serpent at all. First of all, she shouldn't have, she should have been with her husband. She should not have thought that she was independent and she could just step out. Oh, I can stand on my own. I, I, I can do. I'm just as good as, as anybody. I can move out on my own. Not heeding the instructions, which the angels, the scripture implies that the angels, obviously God obviously gave instruction to Adam and Eve. Stay close together. What does the Bible say in Ecclesiastes? Two are better than one. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. So if they would have stayed together, they would have been able to withstand against the enemy. Because Adam would have had, had the sense, you know, this is, this is, this, let's stay away from here. Let's stay away from here. That's, that's that, that serpent, that's the, that, that, that serpent, something's not right. Something's not right. Satan knew how to get Eve by using this charming snake. 
You got to be careful, brothers and sisters. I can go on, but I think we get a point. Make sure you understand the word of God for yourself. First, verse four. And the serpent said unto the woman, he shall not surely die. So there, that's, that's, the, that's a lie right there that Satan gave. See, this is another thing. When, you don't, you, when you're misquoting the word of God and, you're, and you don't know the word of God like you should, you're going to open yourself up for deception to receive a lie. And that's what happened. Eve was open now. There was a hole, an opening for the enemy to, to, to come in with his deception. This is why it's important to be rooted and grounded in the word. The Bible goes on to say in verse five, for God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Satan knew that he could not bring down Adam by using this snake. He knew that. He knew that this serpent by using his musical, charming voice, he could use by, by speaking through this serpent that he could bring down Eve. He knew that would work with Eve, especially since she wandered off from her husband. That was going to work with Eve, but this will not work on Adam. So now that he brought down Eve, now he can use Eve as a tempter to bring down Adam. Adam had a decision to make. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? She ate of the fruit. What am I going to do? Well, she's still standing here. She looks just as good as she did before this point. I can't live without her. Give me that fruit for me. <laughs> Choosing rather to die with his wife. Then they stand on a thus said the, the, the Lord. Now, that, that, that kind of hits home, brother. So the reality is the word of God must be above everybody else. That includes your family, the church, your friends. You got to go by thus saith the Lord. What did Jesus say? He that love a father and mother Sister, brother, more than me, husband and wife, more than me, he is not worthy of me. By Adam choosing Eve over God, he demonstrated that fact that he loved Eve more than God and didn't have enough faith that God would provide a replacement. So Adam and Eve failed the test. Romans 6, verse 16. Romans 6, verse 16. Let's, let's read this scripture right here. Romans 6, verse 16. Romans 6, verse 16. The Bible says, Know ye not, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Whoever you yield to, that's who you're serving. There were two trees in the midst of the garden. The tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Every single day, Adam and Eve had two choices. To eat of the tree of life, choosing by, and by eating that, they were choosing God, or the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And by eating that, they were choosing the adversary, the devil. By, by being disobedient to God's explicit command and partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were choosing Satan as their new leader. And may I go even further? Every time we choose to willfully sin, we are choosing, not God, but Satan as our leader. We want to talk about the Jews when they, they asked for Barabbas and said, crucify him, crucify him concerning Christ. But reality is, brothers and sisters, 
What is, what is the Bible saying in Hebrews? Every time that we sin, we crucify Christ afresh and put him to open shame. You are choosing Barabbas, Satan, and not Jesus. So let's not, let, 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 let's not put all the blame on, on Adam and Eve, brothers and sisters. Let's search our own hearts. What is in you that's causing you to crucify Christ afresh? What is in your heart that's causing you to choose a new leader other than Christ? It's my appeal, brothers and sisters. Romans chapter 5. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Verse 12 and 14. Romans chapter 5. Verse 12 and 14. The Bible says, verse 12 of Romans chapter 5. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was a figure of him that was to come. So the Bible says that all have sinned. So we have all inherited this sin problem. How so? We are born in sin. Notice I said, born in sin, shaping in iniquity. We have all inherited what the Bible says, a sinful, carnal nature. But this nature, brothers and sisters, this carnal nature can be subdued only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you something as we continue on. Now, what is sin? First John 3, 4 tells us what sin is. First John 3, 4 says sin is the transgression of the law. The transgression or violation of the law. First John 3, 4. Going back to Romans chapter 5 now, you notice we skipped verse 13. I want to read that now. Romans chapter 5, verse 13. I want you to notice what the scripture says here. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 13, for until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So the Bible makes it clear if there was no law, there could be no sin. But the fact that there was a law, the fact that there was a commandment given from God that in the day that you eat of this tree, you shall not you shall surely die. He told him that don't eat of this tree. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The fact that he said that that is a command from God. And to disobey that command will be sin. We all know the story in Ezekiel uh, 28. Talking about the fall of Lucifer. Ezekiel 28 makes it very clear. He was perfect. Lucifer, at, who is now Satan, he was perfect in all his ways in the day that he was created till iniquity was found in him. What is iniquity? Sin. So the, what, what, what is the Bible saying? It was a law in heaven. And that law still exists today. Adam and Eve broke the law. Seven day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 951, Paragraph 4. Seven day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 951, Paragraph 4. The transgression of God's law in a single instance. What did I say? In the single instance, in the smallest particular, is sin. Well, it was just a piece of fruit. That ain't nowhere big as taking somebody's life. Let me read this statement again. The transgression of God's law in a single instance, 
in the smallest particular is sin. If God said don't do it and you do it anyway, it's sin. I don't care how big or small it is. And the non-execution of the penalty of that sin will be a crime in the divine administration. God is a judge, the avenger of justice, which is the habitation of the foundation and the foundation of his throne. He cannot dispense with his law. He cannot do away with his smallest item in order to meet and pardon sin. The rectitude and justice and moral excellence of the law must be maintained and vindicated before the heavenly universe and the world's unfolding. So the scripture, brothers and sisters, is very clear on this point. What does sin cause between God and man? Let's go to Genesis chapter three, going back there. Then I'm going to read another scripture. Genesis chapter 3. What does sin cause between God and man? Genesis chapter 3. Notice starting at verse 7. After man sinned, the Bible says in verse 7, the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Where are you, Adam? So, brothers, so there was one point in Adam and Eve's experience before they sinned that when they heard God walking, in a garden in the cool of the day, they will run to him because they long to have communion with him. But after they sin, they're now running from the one that they used to run to. Sin distorted their view of God. But when we turn to Jesus, the sin that we once loved, we will now hate. Brothers and sisters, when we turn to Jesus, Jesus distorts our whole view of sin. That's why the song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full into his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The reason why we love sin so much, because we don't see enough of Jesus. Because when you see Jesus, when you see him high and lifted up on that cross of Calvary, when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you see Jesus and look at his life, brothers and sisters, the change will begin to happen. You'll begin to see what sin really is about. It's not all thrill and, and, and fun and excitement. I like to make this illustration. Sin is like a, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews that the pleasure of sin only lasts for a season. It's woo, then it's all over. Then you're all down worse than you were before. It's like a piece of chewing gum. You put that, pop that chewing gum in your mouth. It's all bursting with flavor and it's all sweet. But after a while, it becomes nasty and you're ready to spit it out. What God wants to give us, brothers and sisters, is something that is eternal. We need to turn our eyes on Jesus, brothers and sisters. And that's what we're talking about in this, in this message. How to go from condemnation to justification. So we see Adam and Eve, they ran from God. Sin separated Adam and Eve from God. Not because God wanted to be separated from them, but because of sin. Isaiah chapter five, I mean, 59, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. The book of Isaiah. Chapter 59, verse one and two. Isaiah 59. Verse one and two. And I want you to know what the scripture says right here. It says, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, 
Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sin causes a separation between us and God. Now, after man sinned. The Bible says that and we read it already in Genesis chapter three, that the eyes of them both were naked. And they tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves, demonstrating that they were ashamed because their, their nakedness is exposed. But let's go to Genesis, uh, Psalm 25, Psalm 25. Psalm 25, looking at verse 3. Psalm 25, looking at verse number 3. Notice what the scripture says here. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. So the Bible makes it clear that those who transgress without cause are the ones who should be or are ashamed. So in other words, brothers and sisters, when the Bible talks about being ashamed or naked, it is a symbol of sin. So this nakedness that Adam and Eve had, brothers and sisters, after their sin, it revealed their spiritual condition. What was their spiritual condition at this time? After they sinned, they were in sin. Prior to that, before they ate of the fruit, brothers and sisters, they had on a robe of light representing righteousness. After they ate of the fruit, they are now naked, in sin, unrighteous. I hope that point is very clear. Steps to Christ, page 17, paragraph two. Steps to Christ, page 17. Paragraph two, that's a, this is a powerful book. You know, if you've never read the book, Steps to Christ, you need to read it. And if you have read it, you need to read it again. Steps to Christ, page 17, paragraph two. In his sinless state, man held joyful communion with man in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, 3. But after his sin, he could no longer find joy in holiness and he sought to hide from the presence of God. Such is still the condition of the unrenewed heart. It is not in harmony with God and finds no joy in communion with him. Mm. The sinner could not be happy in God's presence. He would shrink from the companionship of holy beings. God, I mean, could he be permitted to enter heaven? It would have no joy for him. The spirit of unselfish love that reigns there, every heart responding to the heart of infinite love will touch no answering chord in his soul. His thoughts, his interests, his motives will be alien to those that actuate the sinless dwellers there. He will be a discordant note in the melody of heaven. Heaven will be to him a place of torture. He will long to be hidden from him who is his light and the center of his joy. It is no arbitrary decree on the part of God that excludes the wicked from heaven. They are shut out by their own unfitness for his companionship. The glory of God will be to them a consuming fire. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. Mm. Steps of Christ, page 17, paragraph two. Now what did Adam and Eve try to do once they saw that they were naked. Now, we already read it in Genesis chapter three, verse seven. The Bible says that they sold fig leaves, made themselves fig leaf aprons to try to cover themselves. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, a fig leaf apron is not enough to cover you. They needed to be covered from the from head on down. Their whole body needed to be covered. What is this a, a symbol of them trying to 
cover themselves. What is this a symbol of? Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This represents, brothers and sisters, them trying to save themselves in their own works. Let's look at another scripture here. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse, verse 9. Not of works lest any man should boast. So in other words, by them clothing themselves with fig leaves, they were trying to save themselves by their own works. That's not enough to save you. It's not enough, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in Isaiah 64 that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's nothing that we can do apart from Christ that can save us from the penalty of sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. There's not there's nothing that you can do. You can give you can feed the homeless or do want none of those things, which are good things. None of those things can save you. Only Jesus can save you. You have to be surrendered to Christ. We'll talk about that as we bring bring out these final points. I want to read something here. Job 25, verse 4. Job 25, verse 4. I want to read this. Job 25, verse 4. Job asks this question. How then can man be justified with God? Now, how can he be clean that is born of a woman? How can we be justified? How can we be justified, brothers and sisters? That word justified means to declare our show to be free from blame or guilt. What is the sin that's pronounced against us? We talked about it. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. In other words, by default, because all is sin and come short of the glory of God, brothers and sisters, we are all guilty. We're all on death row. Death row? The Bible says the way of sin is death. That means you are destined to die. But there's a way that we can escape this. There's a way. Romans 6, 23 says, but the wages of sin, it says, for the wages of sin is death. But if it stopped there, we have no hope. It didn't end there. It says, but... But, but, but thank God for that. But, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there's a way of escape. There are not ways to get out of this. There's only one way. Jesus says in John 14, verse six, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man coming to the father, but by me, there are no different pathways. You can go through this way or that way. You can go through Allah. You can go through Buddha. You can go to Muhammad. You can't go through any of those ways but one way and that is Jesus. The word of God is very clear, brothers and sisters. Let me show you that in Romans 3 verse, verse 23. Romans 3 verse 23. Romans 3. Verse 23, talking about justification. We're talking about how to go from condemnation to justification. Romans 3. Looking at verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Being justified freely. No cost. There's no cost for us, that is. But it costs the giver. It cost him his life so that we can have life freely. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We can only be justified 
We can only go from guilty to not guilty only through Jesus Christ. Christ's object lessons. Page 310, paragraph 4. Christ's object lessons. Page 310, paragraph 4. The white robe of innocence was worn by our first parents when they were placed by God in the Holy Eden. They lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. All the strength of their affections was given to their Heavenly Father. A beautiful soft light, the light of God, enshrouded the holy pair. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of whole, heavenly innocence. Had they remained true to God, it would have never, it would have ever continued to enshroud them. But when sin entered, they severed their connection with God and the light that had encircled them departed. Naked and ashamed, they tried to supply the place of the heavenly garments by sewing together fig leaves for a covering. This is what the transgressors of God's law have done ever since the day Adam and Eve's disobedience. They have sewed together fig leaves to cover the nakedness caused by transgression. They have worn the garments of their own devising. The works by works of their own, they have tried to cover their sins and make themselves acceptable with God. I'm looking at page, uh, Christ's Obdolescence, page 310 to 311. Now I'm going to 311, paragraph 2. It says, but this they can never do. Nothing can man devise to supply the place of this lost robe of innocence. No fig leaf garment, no worldly citizen dress can be worn by those who sit down with Christ and angels at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, what did God do for Adam and Eve? Because their fig leaf garments were not enough. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. This is what happened. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. The Bible says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin to clothe them. He had to make coats of skin to clothe them. That's what the Bible says. And these coats of skins had to come from an animal. Now, what do you think had to happen to that animal? That animal had to die. It had to die. When you look at the sacrificial service in the Bible that the people of Israel had to partake in, which pointed to how they would be saved. Pointed to the coming redeemer who had saved them from sin. When we look at that sanctuary service, which this sacrificial service uh, 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 reveals as well. They had to take that knife. Slit the lamb's throat. The sinner who sinned had to take that knife. Slit the lamb's throat. Do you understand that, brothers? That lamb that they raised had to die. That lamb, that animal that did nothing wrong had to die. This spotless lamb, this innocent lamb, which was in perfect health, had to die because this man sinned. This points to Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 1 verse 29. This is what God was trying to teach Adam and Eve. He was teaching Adam and Eve, brothers and sisters, that one day. A redeemer will come. That will pay the penalty. For the human race. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Bible says in John 1 29. John 1, 29, the Bible says the next day, John seeth him and John said, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John saw Jesus coming. And when he saw Jesus, he said, behold, the lamb of God, this is him. This is the lamb. This is the lamb, brothers and sisters, that, that Adam and Eve had to kill. This is the lamb, brothers and sisters, that Abraham had to slay in place of his son. This is the lamb, brothers and sisters, that after the flood, Noah, and the descendants, 
of all these clean beasts pointed to? Pointed to Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we'll begin to get ready to close this down here. Romans chapter 5, looking at verse 8, it says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom he have, we have now received the atonement. Sin separated us from God. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, that nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And because of that, he made an atonement for us. When you break that word atonement down, it's, it's at one meant, making us at one with God again. Where sin separated us because of Jesus Christ, we can be at one with God again. But see, we, we, see, we have a part to play in this as well. Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. We have a part to play in this. How can I go from condemnation to justification? John chapter 1. We know ultimately is what Jesus Christ has done for us in paying a penalty that we all deserve. John chapter one, verse 12 says, but as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. As many as received him, received Christ to them, gave he power. What power is this? First John chapter three. First John chapter three. Power to become the sons of God, even in them that believe on his name. What power is this? Or should I say, should I ask, what does it mean to be a son and daughter of God? What what power does God give us? First John three. Beginning at verse one, behold, what manner of love the father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse three, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So to be a son and daughter of God means you are reflecting Jesus. But we can't do this on our own. We have to receive Christ in order to be like Christ. Verse four, whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law for a sin is a transgression of the law. Let's skip on down to verse nine here. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So the power that God will give us, we will receive him in becoming sons and daughters of God. He will give us power over sin, power to have victory over sin. What promise did God get to Adam and Eve in Genesis 315? Let's go there. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, God says, and I will put enmity. He looked at that serpent dead in the eye, representing Satan. Looked him square in the eye and said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed. It, 
Christ shall bruise thy head. Thou shall bruise his heel. Yes, you're going to bruise his heel at the cross. But ultimately, he's going to crush your head. God says he'll put enmity. This enmity, brothers and sisters, we don't have it naturally in our own hearts. It takes, brothers and sisters, us to become partakers of the divine nature. That's what Peter talks about, that we have to be partakers of the divine nature by escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's the only way it can happen. We can't do it in our own strength. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So what else do we have to do? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, and to cleanse us from all, not some, all unrighteousness, murderer, all unrighteousness, theft, all unrighteousness, lying, all unrighteousness, gossip, all unrighteousness, hatred, all unrighteousness unrighteousness. You go all through the line. He will cleanse you from all of it, brothers and sisters. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. What else must we do to go from guilty to not guilty? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. The Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says we need to repent. Repent means to turn from sin. It means to change one's mind. Change my mind? What's wrong with my mind? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, For the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The, your mind is carnal. You need a new mind. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 12. Let's go there. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We, we need to close. Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the Bible says we're not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What mind do we need? The Bible says Philippians chapter two, verse five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We need the mind of Christ. That's what we need, brothers and sisters. And the only way we can have that mind is if we repent and we confess our sins and receive Jesus Christ into our lives. Is that your desire? Is that what you want, brothers and sisters? Well, you may say, Pastor Davis, I don't have this repentance. I don't feel this repentance. Well, let me show you something right here. Acts chapter five. Acts chapter five. Verse 30 and 31. Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 31. The Lord God, the God of our fathers, raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hung, hanged on the tree. Him have God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. The Bible says that God will give repentance. So in other words, you may not feel repentance or you may think, oh, man, I don't have that right now. So I can't come to God. Just I can't come to God right now. Don't let repentance be a hindrance for you. You come to Christ just as you are. Jesus says, come unto me all, 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 not some all ye that are burdened and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Don't let repentance keep you from coming to God. Now, if you are repentant, 
you need to re you you need to you need to come. You need to repent and turn from your sin. But if you don't, even if you don't have that, brothers and sisters, you can still come to God and say, Lord, help me. I need a new heart. I don't see. I, I, I just need you. Help me. Help me, Lord. Help me. And he'll help you. He'll help you and he'll change you. He'll transform you, brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived into thinking that this whole that you have that in order to be justified also, brothers and sisters, that you need to feel it, that you must have some announcement from heaven. Sean Davis, you have been justified. No, that's not. No, let's go to Galatians chapter three, verse 11. This is our last scripture. Galatians chapter three, verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. We got to have faith in God and his word and in his promises that what he said he will do. Let me read this statement here from Faith and Works, page 103, paragraph one. As we close, as the penitent sinner contrite before God, discerns Christ's atonement in his behalf and accepts this atonement as his only hope in this life and the future life, his sins are pardoned. This is justification by faith. Every believing soul is to conform his will entirely to God's will and keep in a state of repentance and contrition exercising faith in the atoning merits of the Redeemer and advancing from strength to strength, from glory to glory. I'm reading from Faith and Works, page 103. Now I'm reading paragraph two. Pardon and justification are one and the same. Through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to the position of a loyal subject of Christ Jesus, not because of an inherent goodness, but because Christ receives him as his child by adoption. The sinner receives the forgiveness of his sins because these sins are borne by his substitute in surety. The Lord speaks to his heavenly father saying, this is my child. I reprieve him from condemnation, from the condemnation of death, giving him my life insurance policy, eternal life, because I have taken his place and have suffered for his sins. He is even my beloved son. Thus man pardoned and clothed with the beautiful garments of Christ's righteousness stands faultless before God. This can be your experience. You, brothers and sisters, can go from condemnation to justification by faith. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we had to dive into your word. We ask, Father, that you will keep us because we cannot keep ourselves. Give us more of your Holy Spirit. Empower us, Lord, in these last days to do your will and not ours. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Sean Davis with Eternal Lifeline Ministries. Throwing out the lifeline with hand quick and strong. Thank you for listening to this program. If you have any topic or question, please comment below or visit www.facebook.com slash lifeline 1844 and leave a message thank you for your prayers and continued support god bless you